Paul. Very excited and you know looking forward to uh, talking to you, Paul Alapat. He's the Chief Product Officer of Acuity Knowledge Partners, and Paul has over three decades of experience in financial economics, having worked with the likes of Lehman Brothers, Namura, Amba, and Moody's. He's also a guest professor at IIM Bengaluru, where he not only teaches contemporary financial economics but also mentors and counsels MBA students. On today's episode, he will decode the five trillion dollar economy dream of India and the impact of COVID nineteen on this dream, and what should be the next step. If you could decode GDP, you can demystify what GDP actually means for our viewers who don't know it. Right. Uh, firstly, at the outset, uh, thank you, Shraddha, for having me, and I'm uh, delighted to to this, uh, <clears throat> engage in this conversation and. Uh, given that it's a very fluid time it's always a discussion of thoughts it's nothing is definitive i can share what my thinking is on this so just getting to your first question on um, what is gdp i think the best way to uh, think of this is like the value added um, by a sovereign nation or an economy over the course of a calendar year and typically uh, in india the fiscal year is march to uh, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, sorry, April first to March thirty first, so that sort of thing. So it is the uh, sum total of uh, production, goods and services by the residents of that nation. Uh, so um, there are various ways to measure it from the demand side, from the supply side, uh, or from the income side. So that is like if we add up all the rental income, all the uh, profits, all the wages. There is another way to measure this. So yeah, it is sort of a, it's a flow. It is not a stock. So it is basically the flow created during that year. So if you take a household, what is their income? Add all the household incomes. Uh, deduct all the duplication. Add the export minus import, government spending, and investment spending, and that's how you sort of arrive at this. So the formal definition is it's the value addition in a certain geography. Okay, so that, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are going to have the lowest GDP probably since two thousand eight. What does this mean for the common man? What does it mean for all of us? Right, and I think uh, maybe just before that, uh, Shraddha, sort of uh, there is real GDP, there is nominal GDP, and there is uh, GDP at purchasing power parity. When we talk about growth rates, it's generally real GDP. That means GDP at a constant price. So it can be on 2012 prices or whatever base year you want, so that you don't have inflation distorting it. So uh, yes, the general this thing and uh, the pointers we have are from the US because that comes out with numbers a little faster than India releases it. So the general indication for the first quarter was the uh, US GDP contracted 4.8%. And this is with only two weeks of impact of coronavirus, because really this started affecting in March. When we look at the second quarter, the forecasts are anywhere from 20% to 30%. These are numbers that are off the charts. As a financial economist, professional economist, we haven't seen these numbers. In India, it's a much younger economy. We have a certain amount of uh, spending because of the demographics, etc. Uh, and the level of development. So for India, contraction is unparalleled. For us, it just being flat itself is a big major recession. Uh, so the general forecasts are now actually tending towards a contraction. So the forecast um, from uh, I think a lot of rating agencies etc. are more like minus two percent, uh, which uh, historically, I mean, we have I, I can't remember a recession in India. So contraction is. Very, very, uh, we don't have it on record really. So it is um, dire, and the numbers we're seeing out of China 6%. I mean, these are all numbers off the chart. So, if you want perspective, this for professional economists, this is the worst contraction since the Great Depression that's 1930s. Uh, 2008 and all is nothing compared in macro terms. So, what does it mean for a common man? The biggest this thing is this is a basically a supply side shock, which basically meant that certain companies could not work because of this medical illness. They had to shut this thing, which led to cash flow problems. 
which is now le leading to layoffs. So companies are now either cutting salaries or letting go people, airline industry, hospitality. So this Friday, we will get the first snapshot of US unemployment. And if you want perspective, the last number in the U.S. was 4.4%. This Friday, we are expecting it to increase to 16.4%. Wow. So it is, I mean, you can get some sort of magnitude. See, so for economists, this is like the numbers we haven't seen. So basically, jobs, there are about 30 million people in the U.S. who have lost jobs yeah. over the course of four weeks, which is everything that was created over 10 years. So now, hopefully, some of these jobs will come back quickly. But um, this is the biggest problem. We don't know if it is three months away, six months away, 12 months away, 18 months away. The only consensus seems to be a vaccine is at least 18 months away. Which essentially means that you can open an office, but can you ask your employees to come back? Because you don't have a vaccine. So the return can only be voluntary today. You can't compel anybody to come back to work because if they get infected, you don't yeah. have protection so under these conditions it's a very very uncertain environment which we are looking at which basically means that uh, small and medium businesses could have cash flow problems liquidity problems some of them will close down which basically means some un unemployment will increase there is no two ways about it for india the additional complications of poverty people below the poverty line is about 15 percent there is a very real chance that could double yeah so Quite a few, we are talking about millions, could again slip below the poverty line, which basically means we have to have not only an economic goal, we have a social stability goal, which the government has to handle. In the last few years, have been talking about the demographic dividend. Whenever we talk about India, we talk about the huge numbers. Also in the startup ecosystem, the kind of investments that we have seen is also on the back of the, you know, the huge number of people that we have. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, what sense do you make of that as of now in terms of the economics or the economy going forward? Right, Shraddha. So I think uh, th that's a very uh, pertinent point. See, the excitement about India, and, and that will not go away, it was because of this demographics, the demographic dividend. What is a demographic dividend? It is essentially a stage in different country cycle when there's a big bump from non-working age to working age in economics is generally 16 years old so suddenly there's a huge number of people who slip into the working age which basically means they get employed the general factor productivity increases uh, china witnessed this in um, uh, late uh, 70s early uh, 80s today india is on the threshold of that so the big excitement is that we will suddenly get a bump up in productivity in growth in purchasing power because uh, the non-working age moves into working age. Now, that is the reason India had a big premium. And um, the challenge is that these people have to be rightfully trained. They have to have the right education because otherwise they will not get employed. Then you can have a demographic dividend which turns into a demographic debacle or a deba demographic bomb or whatever you want to call it because you then have unemployed youth who... Yeah can get restless and all the things. So uh, I don't think we have lost um, the whole plot, but there is a risk that time is ticking away. These are about the years when we should have started experiencing the benefits of this demographic dividend, a growth acceleration. But unfortunately, because of coronavirus, because of this whole global uh, pandemic shock, um, one or two years will be missed. Um, then there is a whole issue of middle class. There's a huge uh, jump in middle class population, which basically augurs well for spending, the purchasing power. Countries become cleaner because the middle class is much more educated and more uh, demanding of the political leadership, ethics, integrity, etc. So there was excitement about the Indian middle class. So there were a lot of these demographic related, which are medium term, long term trends. So the good news is that. You miss one or two years, you still have 10 years left or 15 years. Uh, but nevertheless, um, we cannot afford to miss it because it is a big boost, which um, Southeast Asia enjoyed it 30 years ago. China enjoyed it 25 years ago. This was India's turn. So for economists, yeah. um, it is a big thing. Or the other segment, which has been like a huge uh, 
I would say as a bone backbone kind of a segment is the MSME segment. And and, and if you look at uh, countries like Germany, which are like so advanced, have actually grown because of this segment mm-hmm. performing. Mm-hmm. What would be required to get this this segment yes. energized? So it's it's a little uh, it's a difficult term, Shraddha. It's essentially, I mean, like especially the smaller you get, you have fewer resources to uh, uh, navigate with. So your cash balance probably is one month. Your liquidity is tight. You cannot afford to keep employees on your roll. Credit banks would be very careful. See, the big problem in India was that the banking system, the NBFC system, was not healthy when we went into this crisis. So the credit flow as it was, it was very weak. And the credit flow is like blood circulation, as I keep saying. If blood is not circulating properly, your entire body starts weakening. So that yeah. was the state of the Indian economy. Our GDP was going down to about 4% before this, despite low oil prices. So despite favorable external environment, we were decelerating. So the banking system enters this unhealthy. So right now, they are in no position to bail out and keep credit growing, especially to the riskier segments, which is the small and medium. So I think that there will be a, a definitely an economic stimulus package. I mean, they're talking about the second stimulus package that the finance minister is working on, yeah. which will again sort of give incentives. RBI will sort of give, I think, a concessionary credit so that banks can lend it onwards. I think the big challenge is that um, RBI can initiate it, but the banks have to implement it. So they can give all these incentives, like they made this uh, fund to give out to mutual funds because of the uh, Franklin Templeton problem. Now the question is like, will the banks carry on with that fund and sort of make use of the credit facility to sort of actually lend? So you, like you can take a horse to the water, you can't force it to drink. So yeah. it is like pushing on a string. So that is a whole issue of confidence. So if a bank is not confident about the quality of its NPAs, it is going to be very, very careful. So I think. Uh, what we are worried about is that the banking system is not um, will not be very supported because they are in a weak position. The NBFC is in a weak position. So the first casualties will be the micro industries and the small industries and the medium enterprises. And these are labor intensive industries. So the impact on unemployment is disproportionate. Yeah. So I think uh, it is a uh, Something that, uh, yes, you will have to have very, very focused subsidies. You'll have to have focused bailouts. Uh, you will have to sort of uh, increase government spending because right now demand is a problem. If I start losing jobs, private spending today is what? Groceries, medicines, essentials. Nobody's going out to buy a car. Car sales in April was zero. Yeah. Uh, nobody's going out to buy any white uh, consumer I mean, durables. There is no hurry for a big holiday. You can't travel anyway. So spending, private spending is almost at a standstill. Everybody's sort of cutting back and being careful. So in this environment, you need the government to basically jumpstart the economy. They have to create public works. They have to create public housing. They have to go after infrastructure spending and create demand for all these small, medium enterprises and even large enterprises. So creation of demand is almost now a government responsibility till we get a certain amount of private traction and external yeah. demand. And external you demand know, today. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry. What were you saying? External no, demand? It's, it's a big problem too, right? So the big, uh, let's take China. China is the first one out of this coronavirus, at least they've sort of uh, opened yeah. back. So factories are working. Problem they're finding is that uh, where do they export to? Countries are, firstly, shipments are not easy. Flights are, uh, cargo flights are not available. The consumers in America are not waiting for Chinese goods to splash money out on. So supply side is not enough. You need to have the demand side also brought back. So private demand will take some time. So you need public demand, government spending to bridge that gap. We've seen a lot of lending startups come up and many of them have gone on record to say that they wouldn't be lending at this time, right? So there will be a huge capital crunch from all the sides. Uh, no, actually, liquidity is going to be a problem. So actually, you will have to have more and more risk capital, more venture capital and that sort of uh, equity participation. Yeah. Uh, you know, what are some of the major reforms of policy, policy changes uh, that 
you think needs to kick in now to make this whole make in india work see i mean uh, this reform is always a medium term sort of uh, go i mean you sort of you never stop at it it just is ongoing uh right now the immediate this thing is there's a medical problem you need to attend that second you have a social stability poverty issue there are a whole bunch of migrant workers who are without jobs construction workers who live from month to month on daily wages etc uh don't have had may soon start losing uh, their wages and salaries so you have to address poverty uh, you have to make sure that these people are first bailed out that there is directed subsidy that reaches this because see you have a medical problem that has to be sorted out one second is you have social stability you have to make sure that the society remains stable yeah. that you don't have riots you don't have people desperate and in, uh, in remote areas without access to medicine etc so they have to be attended to then you then look at okay you have this economic stimulus etc which is something that okay you can throw money at um general estimate is that india can afford to be a little more uh, um uh, aggressive in terms of public spending uh, the general thing is that right now i think the deficit they're planning is about 2.5% 3% general estimates is that we can go up to 5% deficit or 6% deficit temporarily and uh, that will give you a certain amount maybe uh, the us is spending about 15% deficit maybe we can't afford to go that level but about 8% we can still i think uh, get on with temporarily so and that translates to several hundred billions of dollars which is quite a bit of money if you sort of spend properly so i think um, so two three things medical immediately um you have to sort of get people's health under order second is social stability and third is uh stimulus to create aggregate demand the long term reforms land land um, um, acquisition is a big problem uh it is i mean uh, they passed what is it, the lar act in 2013 which was about resettlement and rehabilitation but because there's a it's a concurrent list the state governments and the central governments it's apparently become quite a mess so land acquisition is a big problem uh, power infrastructure is still weak our roads are just still uh, not where it should be so i think uh, the general environment for manufacturing in india is still very challenging so this whole thing about make in india is good it's the right thing but you have to have a supportive infrastructure you have to make uh the ease of doing business seriously streamline subsidies is one thing see subsidies is not good it's good for short term because what happens is you create weak companies so you can only give it to nexus now in a crisis yes but that is not the solution the solution is that you need to have competitive infrastructure you need to have land acquisition that is easy you have to have red tape that is remote you cannot have bureaucracy i mean what is it 30 approvals you need to start a company you have to be as competitive tax rates have to be incentivized i mean we have to get out of this this thing about let's quickly get i mean like this tax the wealthiest people 40% whatever how oh, you're disincentivizing the people who are the entrepreneurial class and who have options of going abroad so i think we have to be very sensible we have to be very creative we cannot panic in this environment we become i think of uses as an opportunity and i think there are a lot of opportunities which um, uh, we can go on to later but i think uh, uh, and we shouldn't obs- be obsessed about this five trillion economy goal it is not the level that matters it is the rate of growth and we can also elaborate on that um since this is a topic was of uh, five trillion i thought uh, no we will address it <laughs> <laughs> yeah no because we have been uh, uh, at least in the we have been chasing that number right and since last 12 18 months if you see that's what we have been talking about as a country we yeah, are but actually honestly uh, that, that is the least of any uh, professional economist worries it is a uh, uh, a level is not what we live with what we live with is a rate of change as long as your rate of change is in the right direction it's healthy that's what motivates people i don't look at okay this is going to be 10 trillion 8 trillion i look at is it growing 8% every year are my children getting better lives this is what makes a difference it is not about oh i'm 2 trillion or 10 trillion or, because it's always something more than that so i think this fixation with that level is misplaced it should be instead on the rate of growth so as long as the economy is growing 8% in real terms it is a very healthy number 
anything about seven seven and a half percent is globally among the fastest. And I think we should reorient ourselves towards that because this fixation with five trillion, firstly mathematically it's not possible. It was never possible. Uh, it's in nominal terms, but even with inflation, uh, five trillion by 2025 is not realistic. Now with the two years lost due to coronavirus, uh, it is not possible. But I don't think that is the end of the world. And I think the messaging has to change. It is not five trillion. It is eight percent, and the rate of growth is always what drives people. Drives economies and makes difference to people's lives. It is um, yeah. not the absolute level. Right now, the problems are coming from everywhere in all the sectors, all the segments. What are some of the things that we can do? Um, uh, yeah, so, so see, I think um, uh, the Southeast Asian story was basically an export-driven sort of uh, uh, growth story, and that was right in the 60s and 70s and uh, maybe early 80s when the world is very globalized and open to sort of uh, free trade and uh, the US consumer was willing to take on a lot of debt. I think things have changed a lot. It's not as globalized. There is a lot of worry about trade wars and protectionism, etc. So India may not have the luxury of the same export-led story, but fortunately India has got a lot of domestic demand. And I think a more relevant narrative for us is to look at um, our immediate neighborhood. I mean, one success story, I don't know how many th are familiar with, is Bangladesh. It is today, um, well, before the crisis, growing about 8%. Its per capita income growth is faster than India's. Once consider the basket case in South Asia, the last five years or last 10 years, they've averaged manufacturing GDP growth of 10%. Right. And it's, it is not rocket science. See, we have stuck to a lot of glamour and biotech and all of that. They stuck with garment exports, very labor intensive, very um, low profile. I mean, sort of not glamorous. Nobody wants today. They are the second largest garment exporter in the world after China. It has transformed the economy's acceleration. It has brought a lot of women employment. 80% of workers in garments are women employees. So getting women participation in the workforce, which is again a, one of the liabilities in India, um, has be, been transformational because that makes a lot of other societal changes, uh, which are non-economic also possible. Once you get women empowered and women engaged in economically active professions. So there's a lot going on in um, uh, Bangladesh. I think we should pay attention to. Uh, they have not shied away from government exports, promoting government export microfinance. They made sure microfinance is uh, vibrant and rigorous and fund small companies. They made sure women engagement, as I said, they made sure that large scale enterprise in garment sector is encouraged. In India, we have discouraged large scale enterprise in garments because we believe that that should be reserved for small and medium, whereas large enterprises should go to textiles. So I think all of this needs to be reviewed. I mean, we, yes, we have a very successful software. We have a very successful outsourcing. We have a very successful I think even the bio, bio, I mean, biomedical sector. But there are a lot of others which are labor intensive and we cannot forget we have a lot of people. So we just cannot look at engineers and just employ them. We have to employ a lot of people who are not equally qualified. Uh, we have to get our women into the workforce. Yeah. So I think a lot of those things, um, um, I think the examples are there in the neighborhood. And we should follow that. I mean, India's India used to be bigger than Bangladesh as a garment exporter. We are now smaller. Probably even Vietnam has overtaken us. So I think uh, we have to sort of, I think, pay attention to morals that are relevant to us. And um, also, yes, continue with IT. Continue with um, all the other um, areas that we are very successful at. And at the end of the day, see, we have to, every country has to work with its own comparative advantage. Ours is people. Ours is um, online skills, digital skills. Ours is also geography and time zone. We are well positioned to be a logistics center. We are well positioned to be, uh, I mean, like globally, time zones are almost equally distributed from India. Uh, exploit that. So I think there are a lot of things which uh, I think uh, we can do a lot more. And then, of course, tourism, which is, again, labor intensive. And uh, India's variety and geography and history. I think there's a lot more uh, that's possible. So. Um, Yes, we can take general guidelines from the success of Southeast Asia and of Bangladesh. But then we have to then customize it to the Indian context. And India has its own sort of nuances. 
and I think we have to play to our comparative advantage. Yeah. And because the only common theme is uh, bureaucracy has to be cut. You have to be business friendly. You have to sort of uh, make market sort of forces. You can't subsidize. You can't, it's not a charity. You can subsidize initially when it's startup, but you cannot support them forever. If you're not competitive, you're not strong enough, you will not survive in the global market. And I think the final point for um, medium, small um, enterprises is that you're competing against China. So if you're not competitive and if you're not viable, you will not survive. You know, one of the narratives, and I'm sure you would have heard about it, is uh, that right now it's an, it's also a time which India could use in its favor advantageously because of the trade war which is happening and, you know, China affected so massively and all the negative news around China. What do you have to say about that? Like, it, we can capitalize right now. Absolutely. I think um, uh, this uh, China, I thought, was a big opportunity because almost universally, uh, every, every Fortune 500 company with its uh, manufacturing base in China is looking to diversify. Uh, it is a China plus one strategy where you cannot have put all your eggs in one basket because you saw what happens when one country goes into lockdown. So they are very interested in looking at alternatives. And the initial reports are Vietnam, Indonesia, probably ahead of the curve. But um, at the end of the day, there are only two countries of a billion plus people with domestic markets of this size. So you cannot ignore India. And as long as India sort of actually, there are some reports that they are preparing, um, I think, uh, land twice the size of Luxembourg uh, to give to co companies who want to shift out of China. So we must deliberately target these, give them uh, tax breaks. And I think that the big challenge in India is that you have to make this a business friendly country. Yeah. Uh, just talking about making India doesn't work. What, what do businessmen look at? Okay, what happened with Vodafone? Did you mistreat them? Were the tax, uh, this thing, in retrospectively charged? Was that right? These are the things that investors look at. So I think um, you have to create an environment that is stable. You don't change rules randomly or erratically. You don't have tax priorities, which are very short-term oriented. You have to look at a longer picture, the longer term. So I think... Um, we seriously have to have a more business-friendly bureaucracy. And I think uh, it is slowly getting better, but there's a lot of socialism and a lot of historical, I think, um, uh, dead wood that we still carry in our thinking. Um, making money, being rich is not a bad thing, um, which is what China finally accepted. And I think you have to behave in that manner, that let people make money the right way uh, legally and create an environment that is conducive to that. So I think um, uh, th th these are certain missteps that uh, India has to uh, get its act in order because I think there's a great opportunity. It will happen. The diversification out of China, India will be one of the landing points, mainly because the domestic market is so large and attractive. So I think that will be one of the biggest benefits that uh, Indian manufacturing will uh, reap but we have to improve our power structure. I mean, uh, power supply. And basically, the whole electricity, this thing has to, that infrastructure has to be attended to. We have to make sure that uh, land acquisition gets uh, attended to. Labor laws have to be worked on. And then taxation and FDI policy has to be consistent. And we cannot be erratic about it. And we have to have attractive rates of corporate taxation. So I think all these have to work together and... Uh, we will, I think, uh, get this benefit. The other big benefit is going to be digitization. India is already a very digitally sophisticated country. Uh, the one trend that will be reinforced post-crisis is going to be everything is going to be whatever you can digitize, what can be digital, what can be online, make it online. Education. So I think that, again, I think is going to be a big opportunity for India. Um, so, and then as I said, the time zone, the location, the geography, India is very centrally positioned. And I absolutely believe that we haven't, we are not a transit hub. We are not a logistic center. Whereas Singapore and Dubai, which are not ideally located, have actually pretty much eaten our cake. Yeah. Will we see a lot of FDI money coming to us after this pandemic? It will, but it's sort of, uh, 
and uh, I think more or more exciting that quite a bit could be manufacturing, which is getting displaced out of China, and um, and I think um, China, whatever um, fairly or unfairly, has uh, been stigmatized because of uh, issues of this origin of the, this thing that they suppress, uh, and they have not handled it the, the best fashion. So I think um, there are certain I think um, wins that India scored and. Uh, there will be a certain more affinity and acceptance of uh, production coming out of India as opposed to, let's say, China. Uh, I think it's for us to sort of seize that opportunity. And um, uh, because of the market size, I think we will end up, uh, yeah, we will end up uh, doing it. Um, but uh, it is, um, um, I think India has acted responsibly. It has sort of uh, brought its um, people back. Uh, we have sent um, even, um, I think, uh, defense resources to bring back. We have supplied medicine to our neighborhood. So generally, it's, I think, acted responsibly. It has been very tough with the lockdown, despite risk to a lot of migrant workers, etc. So overall, I think if you look at countries, I think India is one of the countries which I think has acted very sensibly and uh, pragmatically. It's now <clears throat> sort of, uh, now you sort of uh, convert it into FDI. and. Uh, so I think yeah, uh, we've ticked. Yeah, we've ticked one of the points, but I think the other point is that we have to be reliable and we have to be economically sophisticated in our legal environment and regulatory framework. The growth that we will see because of the whole digital infrastructure layer that we are creating that will be far superior than the overall real infrastructure that we have in the country, and that will lead to uh, growth for us. What do you have to say about it? No, absolutely, and I'm I'm glad you sort of uh, touched on that because. Um, See, there are two fundamental, uh, I think, policies that have been executed uh, and uh, implemented. First, of course, Aadhaar, this uh, a unique ID system, is the largest in the world. Uh, why is it so transformational? It is transformational because biggest problem in rural India is identity. Yeah. It is very difficult for a poor uh, farmer to establish his identity. So you have property transactions which are abused. There is like all sorts of uh, hawala, this thing. So identity stops uh, financial um, uh, advancement. Okay, credit cards. How do you issue credit cards if I can't establish identity? So I think just the fact that now you have a reliable way of identifying somebody means financially, a lot of services now can open up on credit in rural India. So literally, rural India can slowly start joining the mainstream. So I think this Aadhaar is underestimated. Um, and I think it will really help us uh, uh, get rural India incorporated into the mainstream. The other fundamental and I think uh, important uh, policy execution has been on GST. This GST essentially has reduced the scope for tax evasion the duplication of taxation, cascading taxation. And for the first time, India's states are one market. Before this, if you needed to supply Bangalore, you needed to have a factory in Karnataka. If you needed to supply Bombay, you had to have, because of the border excise and whatever costs of business. So it was literally fragmented markets. It was like each state was a different country. For the first time, we can have one factory supplying the same price goods across India. So I think that's transformational scale. I think the execution has been poor. It has been very complicated. It is literally, if you're in a restaurant, one air conditioned part has got a different GST, non air conditioned. I mean, it's like, it's not even uh, sensible. So I think that's getting streamlined. The compliance costs are very expensive. So the exporters, the small companies, medium companies, they say that the cost of complying with this, we can't afford. So I think that has to be streamlined. I think there is something like fortnightly you have to report these taxes to some several agencies. So I think they are slowly getting it together. But fundamentally, it's the right initiative, and it will finally make India one market. So that is the other attraction for FDI because now India, on paper, we say 1.3 billion people, but it was not 1.3. It was like different states with these pockets. So I think these two are very fundamental. Um, Demonetization was not a professionally uh, supported uh, scheme. It was supposed to be for black money, which didn't. So that one, um, 
I would say it was one of the missteps. But um, I think GST and Aadhaar are very fundamental and uh, will help the com- country over time. And um, uh, I think it is um, radical. And, uh, and I think cred- great credit to Nandan Lakani because I think um, the implementation, I mean, you're talking about a billion people. It was rolled out pretty much on time. Um, so I think uh, it is the largest, most reliable identity program anywhere in the world. If we have to continue to grow at 8% or 7%, 8%, what you, what you have been talking about, what are the few key things that the government should be listening to, we all should be listening to? And, and you know, as citizens also, we should be influencing that those things happen. Well, absolutely. See, it, it's a large country. It's a diverse country. It, 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 manifold challenges. Uh, I think just keeping the country together stable is a big achievement. And that's where I think you have to give credit to China. Can you imagine an unstable China? So I think uh, we have to give a lot of credit to that leadership. Um, so I think for India, uh, as, as yeah, I think my goal would be 8% growth as uh, soon as we can get back to it. Um, it is not going to be the next two years. The next two years, I think most likely uh, we will be almost uh, maybe at, if you're lucky, 5% better than um, uh, over two years. Um, in terms of how do we get back to 8%, I think we have to do play to a comparative advantage, which starts with human capital. So we have to make sure that the demographic dividend plays out. We have to make sure that the our people coming out of schools and colleges are educated with functional literacy. What do I mean by functional literacy? They must be able to write basic good English. They must know basic mathematics. They must have basic skills of presentation. They must be functionally employable. And um, uh, in fact, the other panelists were supposed to, who will probably join later. Uh, he will tell you a lot more about the difficulty in employing temporary workers today is that half of them you have to train again. They're not employable. So I think we have to make sure that this demographic dividend is not wasted. Second, the middle class. Uh, generally, the rule of thumb is once middle class hits about one third, 30% of population, it is dramatic. Why is the middle class so important? The middle class <clears throat> pays a lot of attention to education. For them, the main priority is that the children get educated and have a better life, because of which they pay a lot of attention to cleanliness in government, to corruption, making sure. It, Teachers are well paid. We don't have rush for wars. So there is a certain amount of responsibility that comes with the middle class. Plus, the middle class has got surplus to spend on consumer durables. FDI is not going to come into a poor country. FDI will come in when you have people with spending power. So middle class is important. The other is women participation. And I will keep repeating this because India, I only learned this today. Only 23% of women are in the labor force, it is the 10th worst participation rate in the world. Wow. Only countries worse than us are Iraq, uh, Somalia, Sudan. I mean, these are war torn countries. And we were better <laughs> off 10 years ago. And part of the reason is that I think garment sector is not, I mean, growing much. A lot of the women workers were in agriculture. They're not needed so much. Then religion and culture, a lot less women, Muslim women participate. Uh, the richer uh, women in other religions also prefer to not work. So the participation rate, women participation rate in India is one of the lowest in the world, which has its own consequences. Yeah. And I think we are basically not using the skills and talents of half our population. Yeah. And there is estimates like in, in, if the US and UK could increase their women participation, and that is already a high rate, their GDP productivity could improve 1% to 2%. So can you imagine what yeah. we are missing out on? So that, then I think credit, we have to look after our banking system. We have to clean it up. Today, NPAs are 9%. The biggest worry right now is during this crisis, the NPA, the bad loans could double, which basically yeah. means you have a dysfunctional credit system. And that is a blood circulation. Without that, all 8%, etc. is a pipe dream. Infrastructure, we have to attend to power. We have to attend to land. We have to attend to labor market, um, roads. So literally almost all these infrastructure issues, above all, I think land and labor, we have to really work on. 
land acquisition is a nightmare so this uh, law uh, whatever legislation which was supposed to help rehabilitation and resettlement has not worked out has not been implemented properly so a lot of the problem in india is the policies the right ones it's the implementation that is lacking um so i think uh, these are some of the things that i would start with in an out is work for uh, comparative advantage which is human capital which is like we have a great capacity for education we have very talented engineers doctors specialists make medical tourism a big thing tourism as it is we have a lot of let's make medical tourism a big thing let's make logistics let's make indian airports the hub for regional travel let's displace traffic from dubai and singapore so i think that it's almost like it's a big country with many challenges we have to work on all fronts at the same time we cannot ignore the small enterprises because they are labor intensive we cannot ignore the rural markets because that's where a lot of the country lives so there are it's almost like working on all these fronts at the same time and then of course slowly weed out corruption weed out tax evasion i mean weed out um, a lot of ponism um make sure that the market forces start uh, getting a free play uh, we need to make sure institutions are strengthened the supreme court the reserve bank of india these are strengthened if they are does not flow into a vacuum you have to have their rights protected so i think um, uh, i think a very steady hand very sensible environment and what um, investors hate is uncertainty so sometimes i just say that you don't have to come out with anything dramatic just make a sensible policy and stick with it and be patient and people will come india is a big market there are i mean this is the last frontier left china is already quite saturated this is the last frontier for new <laughs> consumer demand so i think um just play to that advantage and make sure that our children are educated and they come out with the right skills um and then eventually the brain drain will reverse today we still lose some of our brightest people to developed countries and eventually i think as you create this environment slowly people will start coming back and uh, it is a virtuous cycle which has happened in the software industry where a lot of experienced yeah. indians have come back from silicon uh, i think the venture capital field you have a lot of indians with experience coming back um biotechnology it's happening so i think um, we can turn this into a virtuous cycle and i in many ways of many reasons demographics included i think india in many ways is like economic future i mean along with china and lot of asia so the gravity of economic uh, the center of gravity for economic activity is shifting eastwards and i think we just have to uh, pre- prepare an environment that is conducive and politically create uh, stability and peace and uh, a lot of these things i think it will solve itself it's about not interfering too much not micromanaging um not doing things which is erratic and then execution we have to execute implement well our policies are good our plans are good but the implementation and execution leaves a lot to be desired Paul thank you you know i am taking so much and i'm sure everyone who will watch this will take so much and, and hopefully yeah uh, we learn i i you know one of the things that sticks to with me is what you said that our advantage to make this 5 trillion dream or whatever uh, is that we are the last frontier left in terms of the consumer demand that this country that's a very phenomenal thing that you've said because that nobody can negate like that is a truth not sure and uh, but it just let's see none, none of this for granted so yeah. i think that none of this is inevitable yeah it's just that we have a major gift that we have to sort of uh, make the most of it yeah we can also waste it so i think um, none of this is an entitlement it is for us to sort of cherish and nurture and uh, optimize it and i think that's uh, what will uh, uh, the generations that are ahead of us will uh, hopefully be grateful for i mean that we acted responsibly and created a future that is uh, better for them and yeah. i think that's the excitement about this country i mean in fact people ask me why is uh, india such a happy country though it's such a poor place and i the only simple answer i said is just that i know my children will live better than i did 
Yeah. And many Indians know that, which you can't yeah. say in a lot of other countries. And I think yeah. that is the most, uh, I think, um, uh, motivating, um, in, inspiring sort of, uh, um, I don't know, uh, thought or uh, drive. What is your equation with money? What's your relationship with money? What has it been over the years? I mean, it's important, um, but I mean, I think it's, it's, I think, I think everybody knows it, right? It's a good, uh, it's a good servant, a bad master. Um, I mean, it opens a lot of doors. I mean, uh, and uh, creates a certain, I think, uh, amount of opportunities and uh, you get to, I think, um, see a lot more of the world. You get to, I mean, I think experience a lot more of life uh, if you sort of manage uh, the resources well. But it's, it's not money in itself. It's basically money as a servant yeah. that you use it for charity. And I think that has been the most satisfying. I mean, I lived half my life overseas and coming back to India, the most satisfying is that uh, a little money can make a big difference in India. So you can educate uh, people's children. You can attend to somebody's surgery. So I think um, you can make a big difference. So I think it is very satisfying. And I think uh, it is a privilege that we are able to uh, uh, be philanthropic, that we have the money to help others. And I think uh, people in that position should feel privileged, absolutely, that uh, um, you are able to. Uh, help somebody but um, or, it is uh, yeah. yeah so I think uh, no money is a good thing as long as you use it properly and uh, you don't sort of uh, yeah become yeah. a slave to it if you had to pick one thing if you had to implement a change what would be that one thing that you will pick <laughs> never ask an economist uh, one thing <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's uh, see the Long term, it is about uh, demographic dividend. We have to absolutely make sure that uh, uh, our children and the students coming out of colleges are functionally literate and uh, they're employable so that we don't waste this demographic dividend. Um, and if, if I'm allowed a shorter term, this thing, I think get our land acquisition under control because it is holding up a lot of investment particularly manufacturing related which is very land intensive it is labor intensive and india at the stage of development we have a lower share than we should have uh, we are much lower than we are at least four five percentage points lower than bangladesh as a share of gdp so i think uh, it will create a lot more jobs equally tourism and the tourism is the other favorite i have because it is labor intensive it doesn't require a lot of education and India has got a lot of history and diversity and it is well located geographically. So I think tourism, both regular tourism and medical tourism, I think we should uh, make the most of. Okay, there's, there is this audience question which has come multiple times. So I have to ask you this. Do you think sure. interest rate would be further waived off for businesses and an extension of moratorium till December is a possibility? No, I think the interest rates, yes. I mean, and uh, not only the level of interest rates, there'll be more quantitative measures. So I think the RBI will open up its floodgates. And that is the monetary policy is the easiest thing to sort of do domestically. Uh, the consequences that we might have to be careful about what is the impact on the Indian rupee. The Indian rupee might weaken if you do it uh, excessively. But yes, absolutely. I think we will see lower um, interest rates. Moratorium, uh, possible. Possible, but just see, moratorium is a double edged sword. In fact, it is not forgiven. This debt is just getting delayed, and you're, I mean, banks are allowed to charge interest on interest. So I'm not so sure it's a good idea because you eventually somebody has to bear that debt. So either the banks have to write off, or the government will have to step in and write off, uh, or they keep it on your uh, individual balance sheet. So a moratorium doesn't mean your obligations go away. Somebody, private sector, government, or the banks finally have to bear it. So I'm not sure uh, extending the moratorium would be a great idea, but uh, I think uh, helping with salaries or subsidies and people out of unemployed I and mean, giving them some sort of government jobs, something like that is much more constructive. But yeah, interest rates, absolutely. Monetary policy will be eased. <laughs> 